the application architecture is in a pretty good place right now. And so while our fictional team and company are working hard to improve it and bringing in new users, we're going to pause and talk about Docker and containers. Yes, yes, this topic, I swear, it has so much buzz, but for good reason. It really is that useful. Now, before we dive in, just a disclaimer, we're not going to go exploring the ins and outs of Docker here. That, you know, the first reason is that it's such a big topic that well, if we did that, we wouldn't be able to do anything else. And the second reason is that we have an entire free video series dedicated to this topic called the Hitchhiker's Video Guide to AWS, ECS, and Docker. And I'll be sure to link below or link to that below this video. However, we are going to cover the main concepts so that you can see how it fits into the picture of infrastructure. And this way you can ideate your own architectures with it. So first up, let's talk about how things are right now with both our EC2 instances hosting our application and our local development environment. So right now we just set up the application directly on the machine itself. And when we're ready to share it with the world, we direct the traffic to a port on our machines. Now, in our EC2 instances case, the traffic is coming from a load balancer, but it's still, after it comes from the load balancer, going to go to a particular port on the instance. Well, there's a few problems with this that aren't immediately obvious. So first, our application can be affected by the host machine. And you know, when I say that out loud, <laughs> you know, the first reaction is probably, uh, oh yeah, of course. However, it becomes a much bigger problem down the line. So what happens if you need to do a major operating system upgrade? What happens if you need to update some package, some packages on the host to newer versions? And what happens if you want to change the operating system altogether? Well, you're going to be tweaking your application to fit the particular host. So for example, the way that you'd configure your application on an Ubuntu a Linux EC2 instance is going to be different than how you do so on a Windows one. And so if you wanted to move your app from one to the other, well, suddenly you're going to wind up managing different configurations of your application. You'll have all the settings and details for when your app is on Linux, and then you'll have a different set for when it's on Windows. So you wind up having to manage two versions essentially. So next is that our application can be affected by other apps and services on the host machine. You know, even though in a perfect world that will never happen, it's, that's not the reality of things. Things will overlap. So let's say that you want to cram two different versions of Node.js on your system. Well, how do you manage these dependencies differently? Now, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely possible, uh, but depending upon what package we're talking about, there may or may not be tools to help you do this. Um, if your app depends on different types of background services and different versions of those services, you know, management's gonna become even more difficult. And, you know, let's, in this example, if these are applications, what happens if both of them are web applications that need to accept incoming HTTP traffic on port 80? Well, if you're, since your machine only has one port 80, you know, what are you going to do? And then third, making the most out of your host machine is more difficult. So what I mean by that is this. At any given time, whatever app you're hosting on your instance is probably not taking up all of the free space, memory, and CPU. And so you may wind up with all these servers that have spare compute and memory that's just, you know, waiting there in the off chance of a traffic spike or, or I guess, you know, that you're going to hit the front page of TechCrunch. Well, given our scenario we're working with, what if our fictional company decides it wants to make another app? So maybe it wants to make a data processing application. Well, one option would be to remake our architecture thus far for this new application. Just make a new fleet of servers with a load balancer and a, probably not a different database, but then just go, you know, complete clean slate. But a more sensible and economical option would be to put these new data processing applications on the servers we already have. This way we aren't wasting things, but, you know, even though this sounds great, we know that there's two really big barriers to this. And that this application may require different things from this host machine. You know, even if it doesn't want to be on port 80, 
Well, maybe it requires a different version of a Linux package or a different version of your framework that the other application doesn't want, right? And of course, if that's the case, well, then what this one wants, you know, and what we change this box to give this one may affect the other application and vice versa. Now, these are three major problems that come with trying to deal with this. Uh, for those of you who are in this space and maybe don't know about Docker, well, then you're probably reaching for a virtual machine right now, and that's absolutely a solution. But they're far heavier than the trendy new age solution of Docker. <laughs> so Docker can solve these problems. But before we talk about how it solves the problems, let's walk through some of the main concepts and what it can do for us. So first, let's talk about the main component of Docker. It's not the main component, but it's the main initial component of Docker, and that's going to be Docker images. Now, ignore the word image for now if that's confusing for you. Uh, the easiest way to think of a Docker image is that they're like templates for containers. Now, obviously, this is simplified if you know what they actually are, but it's very practical. Uh, it fits in almost perfectly from, from just a practical day-to-day -day implementation standpoint. Now, the way you go about creating a Docker image begins with what's known as a Docker file. In the Docker file, you list everything you're going to want in your container, ultimately. So in this example, we're saying, okay, in our Docker file, we're going to want the Ubuntu operating system, Node.js, and our application code. Now, one of the things to point out immediately is that, yes, you can, for your containers that you will make, you can define an operating system. Because with containers, you can, can, you can define whatever the heck you want in them. And if that's fuzzy, don't worry, we'll, we'll talk about it shortly. But after we've made this Docker file, we then build an image from it. And that image is now what we're going to use to create containers from it. Now this can be a little bit confusing because we've said that a Docker image is like a template for containers. Well, a Docker file is like a template for Docker images. So you kind of have to juggle that concept uh, in multiple directions here. But just don't forget that you define a Docker image with a Docker file. And then from a Docker image, you can make containers. And this Docker image is going to have the things in our Docker file in it ready to go so that we can create the containers from it very fast. So speaking of which, we can finally talk about the containers themselves. When we're ready, we can make containers from our Docker image. When you make a container, it's going to have all of those things in it that you've defined in the Docker image. So in our case, if we made three containers from this Docker image, all three of them would have Ubuntu, Node.js, and our application code. Well, the best part of these is that they're completely separated and isolated. They don't affect each other, and therefore creating containers is an extremely clean way to host multiple things on one machine. Granted, our example is a bit simple here, but let's say we wanted three different applications on our machine. And let's say that all of them are web services. Maybe we have a Node container, a Python app, and um, a Rails legacy application. Well, all three could easily coexist on the same machine without stepping on each other's toes. All three could have completely different operating systems and dependencies, but, and here's the incredible benefit of Docker, the only thing this host machines to have all three of those is Docker. That's right. We don't have to worry about installing different versions of dependencies. We don't have to worry about our host's operating system. All we have to do is make sure that our host has Docker. That's it. And now suddenly, if you wanted to host these containers on a Windows machine, or maybe just move them to a Linux machine, well, no problem. Just make sure that the machine you're moving them to has Docker, and you're good to go. Oh, and if you want to update your host, go for it. The containers are contained anyway, so they won't be affected. Now, hopefully this points out why Docker is just so darn useful. Because now we can make the most of our host machine's resources without having to worry about the host machine. All we have to ask is, does it have Docker? If it does, we can put it on there. Docker manages the containers on the host for us. Now, that's the root, that's the, the main thing. Um, and Docker does a lot more for us in the background. You know, it manages memory usage, CPU, the network accessibility, all sorts of things. 
It makes it so that working with these containers is a pleasure instead of a pain. I say that because when you, if when you hear containers, you think back to you know LXC. Uh, well, those containers were all right, but they weren't nearly as convenient to work with. But also, if you're reaching for your virtual machine right now, that's something to know. The Docker containers are not virtual machines. They're containers. Yes, they can have their own operating system and software packages, but under the hood, they're still just hooking into the main host's operating system and hardware. And thus, they are far more lightweight. Meaning that you can make a ton more containers on a given host than you could with virtual machines simply because they have a smaller footprint. Okay, and so how can all of this help us build our architecture out even more so? Well, we're going to pretend that our fictional company has decided that it wants to launch another application, and we'll deal with that next using Docker and AWS Elastic Container Service.